Good morning, everyone. Welcome. This is um, Enhancing Universal Design for Learning with Technology. So first, I just want to start off by thanking all of you for being here. I know it's really difficult, especially in a year like this year, but also in your first few years to give up your free time. So thank you for being here. And if no one has told you lately, if you are showing up and be doing your best and being positive for your students, you're doing a great job. I don't think we hear that enough. I know when I get praise from administrators or parents, it feels great. So just know that if you're doing that, you're doing a great job. So thank you for being here. Today, I'm hoping that we can start to rethink how we are using technology with our students. And really, I'm going to do my best to stay and not recommend certain platforms or websites. We are all using different platforms, your district might have different pro versions than my district, you might be more comfortable with some websites than I am. My hope is that when we leave this session that we can rethink and use different lenses when we're using our technology and really just being able to provide options for our students to increase engagement. So we're going to start off with who we are, what, what do we know. Um, I'm going to do a little bit about understanding universal design for learning, so I'm going to um, assume that some of you may not be completely familiar with it yet. And even if you are, I always feel like when we do this, I learn something new every time. And then I'm going to talk about enhancing engagement and then um, giving you some time for a wrap up in questions. All right, so I'm going to launch this first poll. This is going to give me an idea of what you who we are who i have in my audience so that i better understand what grade level you are currently teaching and while you answer this one um, i'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself this is i'm in my 11th year of teaching middle school english language arts i'm currently in groton dunstable but i taught in drake it before that i am a former new member committee member and um really being on the committee and attending i attended this conference in person, I think 11 years ago, and it really just changed my career and um, what I'm doing now. Um, and I see we have some higher ed people. I am in my second year of, um, my, of pursuing my doctorate. So I'm currently in um, that program and working with professors who really embrace UDL. So I hope that I can shed some light on how this would look in a higher ed setting. And I see that we have just a couple more people. Almost everyone has submitted their poll. Yes. All right. I give people about 10 more seconds and then I'm going to end this poll. Jean, hello. I'm so happy you're here. Jean and I served on the committee for a while. Our, our time on the committee overlapped. He is a good friend. All right. Let's see. So we have. Um, we're split between K through 12, it looks like, but I'm happy to see some pre-K here. I also, I work with some fabulous elementary school teachers in Groton Dunstable who rock UDL at the elementary and pre-K level. So if you are, if that one person, if you want a contact to kind of talk about more, just send me an email later. Um, so I'm excited to see a good spread. And my next poll is just gonna tell me where you are with, um, using, I don't want that one, I want this one, with, how, with our familiarity with UDL, that just gives me an idea of where we are right now. So I'll give you some time with that. You guys are so quick with this poll. All right, just a few more seconds. I love it. All right, so it looks like you know a little bit. So I am going to talk about it a little bit um, to just give you an overview and re I'm really gonna be focusing on the engagement uh, guideline. All right. 
thank you for giving me some idea of where you are. And we have a first someone who's hearing, hearing about it for the first time. That's so exciting to me. All right, so I'm gonna start off with just a little bit of a scenario and I want you to think through this. So picture it, it is a Saturday morning. It's in November, it's a little chilly. COVID-19 does not exist, we are in person. And so we would probably be in um, Worcester Mass and you arrive in the morning and you are handed this breakfast and it looks like a nice creamy iced coffee and an, a sandwich on an English muffin with eggs, cheese, and it looks like ham. My question for you to answer in the chat, will all of the attendees be able to enjoy this meal? And if not, what kind of barriers may exist for attendees when they get this breakfast? So just think about that and then share your thoughts in the chat. Okay, so I'm seeing some great things. Allergies to dairy, lack of choice. Um, maybe you don't like coffee, religious restrictions, especially with that ham and the, the meat and the cheese together. Kosher, vegan, gluten-free, excellent. So this meal, because we're just offering one choice is going to be, um, not everyone's gonna be able to eat it. And so that's why when you go to many conferences, you see them offering a buffet of choices. So people can choose the breakfast that works best for them. They can choose hot coffee over iced coffee. They can choose things that meet their dietary restrictions or religious um, beliefs. And everyone gets what everyone gets a breakfast, but we get to choose what we get there. And so in UDL, we think of this as a firm goal with flexible means. And this is the same thing as when we present a lesson to students. If we do a lecture and then everyone writes an essay, that prepackaged lesson is not going to work for all of our students. So we need to have firm goals and flexible means to get there. All right, so I'm going to play this video because I think it does a better job and it's quick and um, it, you'll get a break from me talking at you. So I'm gonna play this and it kind of gives you an overview of what UDL is. This teacher needs to meet a curriculum goal and she's got a very diverse group of students. And so does this teacher. And this one. Most do. In fact, research shows that the way people learn is as unique as their fingerprints. What does this mean for teachers of today? Classrooms are highly diverse and curriculum needs to be designed from the start to meet this diversity. Universal Design for Learning is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. Whoa, that's a fancy term. Universal Design for Learning. Let's unpack it a bit. Let's think about the word universal. By universal, we mean curriculum that can be used and understood by everyone. Each learner in a classroom brings her own background, strengths, needs, and interests. Curriculum should provide genuine learning opportunities for each and every student. Now let's think about the word learning. Learning is not one thing. Neuroscience tells us that our brains have three broad networks. One for recognition, the what of learning. One for skills and strategies, the how of learning. And one for caring and prioritizing, the why of learning. Students need to gain knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm for learning, and a curriculum needs to help them do all three. But every learner is unique, and one size does not fit all. So how do we make a curriculum that challenges and engages diverse learners? This is where the word design comes in. A universally designed building is planned to be flexible and to accommodate all kinds of users, with and without disabilities. It turns out that if you design for those in the margins, your building works better for everyone. Curb cuts and ramps are used by people in wheelchairs, people with strollers, and people on bikes. Captioning on TV serves people who are deaf, people learning English, 
people in gyms, and spouses who get to sleep at different times. UDL takes this idea and applies it to the design of flexible curriculum. UDL goes beyond access because we need to build in support and challenge. So how do we use the UDL framework to make learning goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone? First, ask yourself, what is my goal? What do I want my students to know, do, and care about? Then ask, what barriers in the classroom might interfere with my diverse students reaching these goals? To eliminate the barriers, use the three UDL principles to create flexible paths to learning so that each student can progress. Number one, provide multiple means of representation. Present content and information in multiple media and provide varied supports. Use graphics and animation, highlight the critical features, activate background knowledge, and support vocabulary so that students can acquire the knowledge being taught. Number two, provide multiple means of action and expression. Give students plenty of options for expressing what they know and provide models, feedback, and supports for their different levels of proficiency. Number three, provide multiple means of engagement. What fires up one student won't fire up another. Give students choices to fuel their interests in autonomy. Help them risk mistakes and learn from them. If they love learning, they will persist through challenges. And remember, always keep in mind the learning goal. Get rid of barriers caused by the curriculum and keep the challenge where it belongs. And that's it. Okay, quick recap. Show the information in different ways. Allow your students to approach learning tasks and demonstrate what they know in different ways. And offer options that engage students and keep their interest. Universal design for learning equals learning opportunities for all. For more information on UDL, go to www.cast.org. And CAST is a great, um, is a great um, resource for a lot of things, all everything UDL. So I want to reiterate that when we lesson plan with universal design for learning, we are still meeting standards and objectives. And that's where we start. I think a lot of people, when they think about universal design for learning, they think of this classroom where the kids just do what they want because we're just giving them all the choice in the world. But we still have firm goals. And in the classroom, that's going to be your standard. And then we have to think about, okay, what is what do they need to do in order to demonstrate mastery of this skill? And that's usually going to be your end or summative assessment. And then finally, how are they going to get there? What is the end goal? And how are you planning for variability? And so again, that firm goal may be something like writing an essay. So everyone will write an essay, but how they get there is where they get the choice and voice. And then it might be a more of a, a content where they have to say, trace the development of theme and they, the end product can be different. So just know that if essay writing, things like that still happen with UDL. I, that's one thing I always get um, as feedback with Universal Design for Learning, but sometimes everyone's gonna do the same thing. So I really wanna focus on the engagement principle of Universal Design for Learning today, because I feel like when we're in a remote or hybrid model, and I think I'm going to assume that most of us are in some kind of form of that. I feel like teachers are really struggling with student engagement, and that's really become a barrier to academic and even social emotional well being. And I, my area of research for my dissertation is universal design for learning and cultural proficiency. So when we went to remote learning, there was a joint statement released by many national education and social justice organizations, and they named UDL and specifically the engagement principle as a, an equitable way to engage students in remote learning. So I'm all about equity and making sure students have what they need, especially in a remote setting. So I'm going to focus mostly on engagement. It does touch on some of the things you'll see in representation and action and expression, though. So one of the first uh, guidelines under engagement is options to recruit uh, interest. So providing options for how students learn and express what they know. And so these are the flexible means to reach that firm goal. So students have a buffet of choices for either their end product 
or the scaffolds or resources or tasks leading up to the end product. So again, if we're writing an essay, they might have, um, they could write about different texts. They might have different graphic organizers or ways to um, generate ideas. And it doesn't have to be, when I say buffet, my pre-K elementary teachers, when you first introduce this, you might give them two choices to start off with. You don't want to overwhelm younger students who are just being introduced to this with a bunch of choices. You might start off with two and then gradually add more as you go on. And I can't stress enough that here relationships matter. So as you create relationships with your students, you're going to be better able to offer them options that work best for them, that are effective, and also reflect the cultural identities of your students. And so this starts with a strong foundation in student-teacher relationships. So an example of this, and I'm an English teacher, um, but this transcends content area, but I'm going to give you an example from middle school English. So the standard here is to determine the theme of a text and trace its development over the course. And so that's the why. Why are we doing this? This is our firm goal. We all need to get here. So my summative assessment is going to be to have students identify that theme um, and they can choose what the, the theme is because like right now we are finishing up reading The Outsiders and there's a whole bunch of themes they can choose from. And they're going to explain how that theme is developed through plot events and characterization. So there are options I wanna to give to them. They could write an essay with the option to dictate their words using Google Read and Write. They could create a video. They could create a visual presentation. And I leave those pretty open because again, you might be really comfortable with Flipgrid and Google Slides or you might prefer Powtoon or whatever your students are using, please use that. But those are some examples of how they can do that. And so then I'm, I need to think about how am I going to get students to be able to be successful on this final product? So I might use, you know, I could scan a textbook that explains this. Um, I could create videos with a screencast and put them into Edpuzzle. I might find something on YouTube. Sometimes do a YouTube search, friends. I can't stress enough. You do not need to reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, you might pull, do a, a mini lesson or a small group lesson through Zoom or whatever web conferencing platform you are using. And then again, they have a choice. This is a text. It does not say they need to read Of Mice and Men. All right, it could be an audiobook. It could be a movie. You could show them or give them options of Pixar shorts to use. They, it could be a TV show that they're really interested in. Different short stories, it could be a novel. Um, but this text doesn't say what text, this standard does not say what text it needs to be. So there's plenty of choice getting there. There's choice in how they express that to me. And again, all of this can be done giving them options to use different types of technology. Another part of engagement is just really amplifying student voice. And I think, I know in my own experience teaching, I'm teaching in a hybrid model, but I have a full remote class and my in-person students have a really hard time collaborating because we're six feet apart from each other. And it's been a struggle for me. So one thing that you really should be doing is getting suggestions from your students. You can do this K through higher ed um, give them an opportunity to tell you what's working for them, what's not working for them, maybe another teacher is doing something that works for them, and you can use technology to do that. So asking them through a Google form or a classroom question or um, a question on Canvas through polls in Zoom or in Meet. Um, and I know Microsoft, if you're using OneDrive, has a forms option. So get feedback from students. They know after a while what works best for them. And then to foster that collaboration, there's definitely platforms out there to help them have discussions and to collaborate. Um, Parlay is a discussion and feedback platform. Um, I've just done on my remote days, a breakout room with groups and they have to record their discussion on a, on a slide. I actually stole one of my 
group slides and put it here and they had to talk about the outsiders. And so I can see what they're talking about and it may, I can see maybe I need to pop into one of those breakout rooms because not a lot of notes are being taken and that might be a hint to me that they need some guidance from me. Um, Flipgrid I have seen used for discussion and even like book clubs or math groups. Um, and then as far as collaboration goes, a shared document between your students where they can work together. Um, Google Jamboard has also been really helpful in giving students an online platform to collaborate with each other, either remotely or sitting six feet away from each other. So I do want to caution, and this is, I've made these mistakes. Um, I think a lot of teachers have made these mistakes on their journey to implement UDL, and that is that not all choices are created equal. And I'm going to give this example from grade three social studies. So the standard reads, on a current map of Massachusetts, use cardinal directions, map scales, legends, and titles to locate and describe the city or town where the school students attend is located its local geographic features and historical landmarks and their significance. Okay, so that's our firm goal. And so giving them flexible means to show this skill, they have the choices of the following. In a screencast, show where your school is located using a map of Massachusetts. Also include graphic, geographic features and historical landmarks. Number two, Create a picture or digital collage of your school and historical landmarks and label it with the town it's located in. And then the final option is in a slides presentation, identify where the town or school is in on a map, describe the geographic features of the area and describe historical landmarks. If you could in the chat, put the number of the option that you think that doesn't quite meet that firm goal. Excellent, so I'm seeing a bunch of twos and someone said no map. This skill, this firm goal is about map skills. And while number two might be beautiful and exciting for your students to create, it doesn't quite get to the map skills that they need. So while it might be fun and pretty and the kids love it, it doesn't quite meet that standard. So always keep that in mind when you're offering choices, especially in the like summative, um, expression of what they have learned make sure it meets still meets the standard and again you might vary the difficulty through a skill progression but it still needs to be aligned with your objective all right awesome so with the engagement principle we also offer options for self-regulation and in this one, I think this is so important for remote students. Um, I talk with a lot of my students and they talk about how they struggle with time management and when, when to take a break, what to do when they need to take a break. And so one way to start doing this is having your students self-reflect. And this is a major part of universal design for learning having your students start to understand themselves and where they are in relation to a standard or maybe when it comes to their social emotional well being I think it's helpful to remember UDL and academics but. Um, the current research is starting to apply it more to social emotional learning, as well as um, how it overlaps with culturally responsive teaching or culturally sustaining teaching and this is really important that self reflection piece to those. Um, to SEL and to CRT. So how can we do this using technology? And again, I'm going to keep this, I'm going to try to stay like agnostic to different technology platforms, but I think building reflection questions into your lesson can be really helpful just to get a quick like temperature check of where your students are either academically or socially emotionally like maybe as they join a zoom call having a poll up or a question of just like you know, show me an emoji that shows how you're feeling today. Um, but also you could add it in 
into an Edpuzzle, a Nearpod, a Peer Deck question. All of those have options um, for you to create your own questions. Um, and then using polls like the Zoom polls, and I think um, Meets has a poll option as well, just to kind of get a temperature check of where they are. And you can align that again to the standard. Um, you could have a progression that leads up to mastery and ask them where they are in that progression. And again, it could be a more of a social emotional well being check. Um, and I think it's also really important that when we give our students asynchronous work that we give them the option or include the like permission to take a break. When my hybrid students are remote, they have a really hard time sitting in front of the computer all day. And so it's really important for us to say, when you feel like you're losing focus, go take a break. So you might include in your lesson a link to a Go Noodle video or maybe another short movement video on YouTube, like a quick like five minute stretch thing. Um, but also it's helpful to help them with their time management. So. Yesterday, I was doing parent student led conferences with parents and I talked a lot about the Pomodoro timer that I use as a grad student and how that helps me focus for about 25 minutes and then I get a five minute break and the timer is, is what helps me and I know it would help my students to have something ding in the background and say, all right, your break on TikTok is over, it's time to get back to work. Um, or just labeling tasks with how long they should be working. So yesterday, me, my students were asynchronous all day while we did conferences, and I just put on my Google slide, like, make sure you're working for about an hour on ELA. And I think also, as they self-reflect, they might realize that they have questions or that they're experiencing something that they need help with. And if they're asynchronous, how can, where can they um, ask that question? So if you're using a hyperdoc or another assignment, you might a um, link to another document that's like a help desk where they can ask a question that you'll check once or twice that day and answer the question in next to it so that when other students look at it, maybe their question is getting answered. Using a digital parking lot, again, it could be a shared doc, a jam board or something like that, but just a place for students to like ask questions or um, you know, make something, give you, make, ugh, make you aware of something that's going on um, is also really helpful. Rubrics and checklists have been very helpful. So this helps students understand the expectations of an assignment and assess their own work before turning it in. So we're not only just self-reflecting, we're self-assessing our work. And a checklist can also help students with multi-part assignments or just tracking all the different things they need to do for all of their classes. So this is thinking about online calendars, digital checklists. Um, I give my remote students a weekly overview that separates a must-do column and an optional work column. That's also really helpful for parents if they're you know, navigating some frustration at home. And then building those rubrics into the assignments so the students know right away what is expected of them. So Google Classroom has that rubric feature and I was very resistant to use it at first, but I will tell you it has saved me so much time grading this year. Um, hyperlinking the, the rubric or just putting it right in the, um, in the assignment has been helpful. Um, and I have a question here. Any suggestions for specific digital checklists you found helpful? Um, so I tend to give them, my in-person ones will get a handout from me, but I've found that something like, um, even in their notes app, they can use, I will often just in a Google doc, use the bullets that are checked boxes and let them use that as their checklist. If anyone has any suggestions about that one, um, please put it in the chat. And again, if I am missing a platform that you are using that you're saying, oh my God, I could totally use X, Y, and Z for it, put it in the chat because I only know certain ones. Okay, so we have Ruby Star, great. So yeah, share resources with each other. If you're using something like this, please share it with the group because again, I am not the end all be all for what um, platforms to use. I'm hoping that people can see platforms that they're comfortable with and use a different lens when using it. So share your ideas in the chat. Thank you. Okay, and then another one in this is 
to kind of tied to rubrics and checklists, but I think also self-regulation and organization is being very careful about how you organize your, your learning platform, how you organize your classroom, how you organize your canvas is so important for your students when they log in to try to find your assignment. So I do it by week and I label everything Monday classwork and then everything they need is attached there. So just being very thoughtful in how you post to your learning platform system is also very important to self-regulation. And then when it comes to feedback, that's another part of the engagement guide um, principle is that you're giving regular feedback to your students. And I know that this is immensely difficult right now where we are on our computers teaching all day, and then we have to go in and type feedback um, to students. I understand. Um, but this, the feedback really helps students understand what they're doing well and what they need more help with. It also helps students see themselves as capable learners and it enhances their motivation and independence. So I think at a time when our students aren't seeing us face to face and we can kind of walk by real quick and say, hey, this looks great. Um, make sure you do this or I really like how you did that. We need to think about how we can transfer this to the, the digital space. So Google Doc comments, um, there's an extension called Moat that works with Google Docs in the comments where you can record verbal feedback. So if you're just tired and you wanna talk your feedback, that's those are some extensions that will help. Um, and then really helping students give peer feedback. You could use something like peergrade.io or Parlay, they all use, um, feedback for students, but it guides them. You can put in different questions that they can give to each other for peer feedback. So you're not just getting the like, oh, this looks great. Because uh, that's what middle schoolers love to do is just, hey, good job. Um, so peer grade and parlay will help them give meaningful feedback to each other. And then something like a screencast or a video that you could push out, say, after reviewing um, an assignment, you notice that a lot of them are having trouble with some certain part of the assignment. You could make a screencast that provides feedback and a little bit of reteaching for a small group of students or for whole group instruction. So you're not writing the same comment over and over again. You can just give that feedback in a screencast. Okay. And I think. One way after getting all this information for me, it was like, okay, how do I bring all of this together? And one way is through a hyperdoc. And this allows you to organize lesson or unit materials all in one place. Okay, so you can use hyperlinks to link to tasks, resources for them, and scaffolds. And you can even link it to, um, I know you can do it in Google Classroom to the assignment where they need to turn it in or to where they need to turn it in on Canvas or whatever your learning management system is. And so these are two examples. One is through Google Slides where they have links to lessons, to visuals for that lesson. They have links to resources to help them so that when they're working on their own remotely or in the classroom on their own, they have scaffolds to lean back to lean on when they're experiencing some challenge. So for example, they might need a graphic organizer and it's linked there for them. They might just want to rewatch the mini lesson without having to go through the pain of the Ed puzzle because they they think the Ed puzzle is probably the most painful thing in middle school. Um, and so, or you can do it more in a Google Doc format where it's the same thing. And this, you know, as um, someone who's in grad school, I've seen some of my professors do things like this where they hyperlink right in the schedule what the, the article that we need to read. Here's an example of what the assignment that I'm looking for is. So this works um, really once they know to click on a hyperlink, you can use this K through 12 um, and it's been really helpful. And I don't want you to feel like, and I should have linked it, but there is, if you just search hyperdoc template, um, you can find a ton of templates that work. Um, they have different things, um, different formats for different content areas or types of lessons that you want to teach. So don't feel like 
oh my god, I'm gonna spend all this time creating this hyperdoc. There are templates out there. So just search hyperdoc template, you will come to a beautiful website that gives you a bunch, and that will save you some time as well. Okay, and so here I have some resources where you can learn more. These are books that I love, I use in my research, um, and I'm tying that into, I know this conference, you had some workshops on racism in the classroom, and so um, anti-racism and universal design for learning and equity by design really focus on how we can use universal design for learning to create an equitable general education classroom for all students, regardless of their cultural identity. And I think that is so important about UDL. Um, and then we have UDL in the cloud, which um, is actually written by a higher ed um, professor. So my higher ed friend, you might wanna check that out because I know you're usually more hybrid than K through 12. So that's a great resource, but it's great for K through 12 as well. And then the UDL now, I can't recommend now if, if you're just learning about this. Katie um, was my super, my assistant superintendent. She's on my research committee. She is absolutely fabulous. Her writing style is so accessible and fun. Pick that up. And then just the UDL progression rubric and UDL flow chart are great if you are looking to, you know, ramp up your implementation. But remember, Implementing UDL, you're not going to walk in on Monday and be a complete master. It's going to take time. I'm still learning. I've been doing this, I don't know, five, maybe six years. I'm still learning. I have days when things are not universally designed and it's okay. Um, it's a marathon, just like teaching is. You're going to sm start small. So I want you to take a moment and just think about what we talked about here today. And I want you to think about one thing you could implement next week for your students as far as tying in some universally designed engagement with the technology that you use, that you use with them. And remember, start small. So I'm going to give you a moment to think. And then once you come up with something, please share your idea in the chat. Emoji check-ins. I love it. That works pre-K through higher ed. I love it. Verbal feedback, yes, hyperdocs are, and the kids love them because everything is in one spot. And I will say, if you have students who struggle with executive functioning, a hyperdoc can be really overwhelming. So you might want to, for that student, give share them a different doc and give them, okay, you're going to start with this chunk. When you're done with that, let me know and then copy and paste in the next chunk for them. So they're still getting the same thing, but you're just changing the, the presentation a little bit for them. A digital parking lot. All right, I love this. Poll everywhere. Okay, so that's something I need to check out. Yes. Okay, so I'm loving that you're already thinking about how to give them options. So again, when we give options, it's not Okay, for this assignment, everyone's making a video on the next assignment, we're all making slides. You have all of those choices um, for them each time. And again, keep it with the platforms you're already using that they're comfortable with. This is really not the time to try to learn anything new for you and for your students. All right, I love some of these ideas. I'm so glad you're getting something out of this starting small and you all have the link to the presentation. Um, if you want to come back to this. So I'm going to, I, we have about, oh, I have more time. I was like, leave five minutes for questions, but we have seven minutes for questions. So I am here, ask me questions. Where is the link for this? I will post it again right now for you. There it is. While, while I'm waiting for you to type up your questions. Um, oh, here we go. What are some examples of student, of exam, of questions to ask students in reflection form? So I guess it would be based on what kind of reflection you're looking for. So if it is, say, we my math teachers call them exam wrappers. Um, and you can actually, there's a lot of um, work on this at the higher ed level as well, exam wrappers. 
Um, but it's just kind of like a little self-reflection after a test or a summative assessment where you could say, what went well for you in this assignment? What worked? And then maybe say, you know, what, what gave you some frustration or maybe what were some obstacles that you had and how did you solve those? How did you get over those obstacles? Um, how did, um, you know, what worked well for you? How do you feel about this work? What could you do better next time? If it's a social emotional kind of well being, it might be, how are you feeling today? Is there, my favorite question is, is there anything else you would like Miss Mayo to know? And some of the things I get in there are really interesting. It's from like, I got a kitten yesterday to, um, I have a lot going on with my friends right now and I'm not feeling great. And I put that on almost any form I give them no matter what it's about because it's a great little check-in and it's a private check-in to give um, to them to reach out to you. Um, if it's kind of like, where are you in the process? I like to give them the progression of the skill that we're working on. So um, my elementary teachers, my ELA teachers, DIY literacy um, by Kate Roberts and Maggie Roberts is the like Bible for skill progressions, but just like what's the entry point? Where do we, what is, does mastery look like? And what are the steps in between? And I have them kind of point to where they are. Like, I'll, this is the one star entry point. This is the four star mastery. What, where in this continuum are you? Um, yes, this workshop is going to be on the MTA YouTube page. This is being recorded. Do you have a syllabus template that was designed with UDL guidelines? I do not. However, I believe, and let me think of where I've seen this, UDL Now by K uh, Katie um, Novak will, has an example of a, a, a syllabus, I believe. And you might be able to find some resources on CAST or on Katie Novak's website as well. I am so happy to hear that you are loving this. Um, one question that I get a lot too, and this will save you some headaches, is how do I grade um, all of these options? So I'm getting videos, essays, Prezi presentations. How do I grade this? And again, it goes back to that why. I am grading on the standard. So I tend to use one point rubrics. Um, Cult of Pedagogy has a great um, blog post about one, one point rubrics. Google them, you'll find them. But in that center column, I am sticking with my standards. I am not grading, did they turn it in on time or did they use color in their Prezi? I'm keeping it to the standard and looking for those that standard in the project. And again, if they had a checklist and a rubric beforehand, I'm hoping that they were successful and in incorporating those into their project. What is one tip for UDL you would give to a pre-service teacher going into their practicum next year? Well, congratulations on getting to your practicum. That's very exciting. Uh, one tip I would give to you is start small. And that's what I tell everybody, but you might start by um, working with your cooperating teacher and saying, okay, I wanna start by giving some choice. And I think that's where most teachers start is by giving choice and just starting small, giving them two choices to start if you're working in a district that isn't working a lot with choice saying, you know what, and with this assignment, we're working on solving for X. I think I would like to give them the option of completing this workbook assignment or recording a screencast of, of them talking their way through solving, solving for X. And starting small there and just really working with your cooperating teacher on that. All right, well, good, good luck, Taryn. Um, I have fond memories of my practicums and my student teaching, and it was definitely something that stuck with me. So good luck. And um, if you ever need anything, my contact information is there. I love, love, love working with new teachers and student teachers. So um, I'm glad you're here today. All right, so we got one minute left. I'm so happy that you came. There's my contact information if you need me. And I really appreciate you being here today. And I just remember the first couple of years of teaching, you're one to show up, 
Year two is throw up because you thought you had it all figured out, but you don't quite yet. And year three is grow up. So that's when you start to figure it all out. And if right now in a pandemic, you are showing up for years one through five, that's all we need. And thank you. You're doing an awesome job.